Hello, Global Family, and welcome to the fourth episode of our widely known talk show, Quiet Please, entirely dedicated to Goldball. As usual, let us remind you that you can follow our talk show, an event organized and powered by ECA, the European Goldball Club Association, in our YouTube channel, but also in the podcast format on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcast platforms. I'm Pedro from Lisbon, and with me always is co-hosting this series of conversations is Vilma from Vilnius. And let us not waste any more time and present our guest for today. He is 51 years old. He is from Stuttgart in Germany, a particular figure in the goalball world, not only because he is a referee, and everybody knows the referees, of course, but also because of his sense of humor. He has more than 30 years of experience in goalball, so today we have a lot of stories to explore and to hear about. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to Alexander Knecht, which, is, which will have the next hour to share with, uh, with all of us his views about goalball, his experience, and what the future can bring to this big sport family. Stay tuned, don't go anywhere, and quiet please. You play, Vilma. Quiet, please. Play. Thank you, Pedro. Hello, Alex. So Hello. good to see you. <laughs> Hello, Vilma. Um, Hello, Pedro. <laughs> you started refereeing in 1988, so it's like 32 years ago, right? How do you see the goalball, the game, has changed during these years? <laughs> it changed a lot. Well, I, actually, I started 87. 87. 87. 33 years. Already, 33 years. Yeah. We did a referee clinic at the European Championships, and that was my start with goalball. Okay. You had a clinic during European Championships? Right before the European Championships. So my okay. first game ever was a European Championship game. <laughs> okay. It doesn't ha happen anymore. No. <laughs> sure okay. not. Now you have to have at least three years experience yet yeah, to be yeah. able to referee at European Championships. Yeah, well, that time it was the start of the level one, two, three program and we only had yeah a few level two and all the rest starts with level one. It was the same. It was my, my third tournament ever was the Paralympics. So it, it yeah. was possible right now. Okay. They trusted you. You were good from the very beginning. <laughs> it looks like maybe. Yeah. So how do you remember the goal ball 33 years ago and how did you see it developing? <laughs> it was Maybe it was a, a different game. Well, still three players and the same court, but we had a big ball with uh, the two kilograms and uh, the game was two times seven minutes. And we had a head referee. The referee was always looking for the high balls. And we had an assistant referee. It's now the far side referee. And the assistant referee was running up and down and only watching for illegal defense really <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh. much more simple no <laughs> okay so the assistant referee had to be really sporty <laughs> oh, yeah <laughs> to be running all the time okay what else well all the stuff around global the the spectators in uh, Seoul at the Paralympics, we played in a very small venue where maybe at least maximum 200 people can watch goalball. It, it was in the, the warm up area of the basketball during the Olympics, and that's where they put the goalball competition in. So <laughs> totally. <laughs> okay. Did you make any proposals that changed the rules during these 33 years? Yeah, well, several times when there was a call for uh, some ideas, well, I did sometimes. Like the, uh, the extra throws, the, the, that there shouldn't be a own goal 
possible. That's part of it. And I can't remember what else. <laughs> I'm going okay. So you said your first uh, like uh, Paralympic Games were Seoul Paralympic Games. And since then you took part in every and each Paralympic Games. Well, right? I, had to, I had a role in every. I was a referee most of the time. I was a, a ITO in Atlanta. 96 and I was a volunteer at the, in the global venue in London. Yeah, so I think it's very creative of you because many referees get upset if they are not selected, but you found a way yeah. to be a volunteer. And it was amazing that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what feeling is it? to see so many athletes from different sports in, gathered in one place in Paralympics? Well, of course, Paralympics is the best. To <laughs> see the whole world together in the uh, Olympic Village, the spirit, it's just the first day when you walk through the village to see all the nations, all the people. That's amazing. That's really, that's sport what I love. Alex, um, how how did you get involved? How, how do you get how did you get started in the in goalball? How did goalball came to your life? Yeah, well, I grew up with blind sport because my daddy was uh, blind. He became blind uh, as a child at the end of the Second World War. So when I was born, my daddy was already blind, and he founded this uh, blind sport group in Stuttgart. So I grew up with the blind sport as a child. And since the beginning, we went to tournaments. We had every year a big uh, competition in Stuttgart. And I went with my daddy to tournaments in Italy. Oh, Alex. The Austria. Sorry, but that was my start. <laughs> and that time, um, we had no, really no goal ball in Germany, only a national team. And that was my start. And then we had a, a tour ball referee clinic at the end. They asked her who'd like to uh, join at a goal ball referee clinic. And so they picked the three youngest ones, the German association. <laughs> I started in goal ball. I never seen it before. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, Alex, there are many participants in goalball, like players, coaches, referees, sponsors, organizers, IPSA, ECA. How do you see the role of referee in all this? Well, it's, of course, in every sport, referees is an important role, but for me, the best way is uh, nobody recognize the referee. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, so what is a good referee? Because I understand nobody noticed the referee if he did a good job. Yeah, so what is a good referee? <laughs> what is, oh, that's a tricky question, Wilma. <laughs> yeah, you are a good referee. What is a good referee? <laughs> well, I think first of all, uh, it's to be fair because mistakes are happening. Mistakes are happening to players, to coaches, and of course, mistakes are happening to referees. But the main thing is it's not in purpose or it shouldn't be in purpose. So that's a good referee. And if there is a mistake, yes, sorry. But you have to say, oh, sorry, that it's a mistake. Um, and to, um, oh, how to say it in my English, sorry. Um, to give the players the chance to do their best at the court and also to the coaches and to be on the same on the same eye level we say with everybody and not the referees higher or whatever no we are all on the same it's our sport all together <laughs> so um what do you think uh when you uh, what do you think about when you are in on court <laughs> okay, let me be invisible again or something like that. <laughs> what do you think when I'm on court? 
That's a tricky question for me. Okay. <laughs> no, um, I just try to focus. I'm not thinking much. Yeah, so what do you focus on? What do you focus on? What are important things for you on court? For me, it's nearly everything in the venue. The coaches, the players, the ball, and stuff around. And of course, the other referee, because we are always a team and the goal judges. Because the technical, because the technical issues are always in your mind, isn't it? It should be. Or maybe more in my... Storage? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's that's a good point because the next question is, do you care which teams are playing? Um, not really. Of course, if there are good teams, I can, as a referee, enjoy the game more because, yeah, I, I like to do really good games and I enjoy really good games. But no, I don't really care who's playing. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that if something goes wrong for the teams, very often the first reaction is to blame it on referees? <laughs> What do you think about it? Yeah, but that's normal. And, you know, <laughs> in in uh, 33 years of refereeing, there are many situations, so I get used to it. Okay. The referee is very often guilty even if he's really guilty or not. But that's that's our job. That's part of our job. Yeah, so are referees ever good enough? Yeah, but that's, I think, also players and coaches are emotional. And in the moment of an emotional eruption, yeah, it could happen. Yeah. But referees, you, referees are the first to blame, yeah? Yeah, but if the referee is still guilty in, in their mind an hour after game or two hours after a game, I think then it's a problem. <laughs> but right after the game, it's okay. <laughs> okay. So, because uh, European Global Club Association, they had one masterclass dedicated for refereeing. And it was obvious that coaches are really concerned about fair refereeing, what you mentioned. So, what do you think we can do, like coaches and referees, to talk together in order to understand maybe the, everything better, so that there is no such a big separation and that coaches don't think that referees are intentionally doing a bad job or being unfair? Well, to be honest, I never so referee who was intentionally unfair really yeah. doing things in purpose against a team no but that's what i said before referees are doing mistakes mistakes are happening but it's not uh in purpose natural okay. natural mistakes from the, from the game uh yeah. actually uh coaches offer to have video system uh to track high balls and long balls Do you think uh, this um, is would guarantee that will be no no mistakes in goalball? <laughs> no, no. Well, I would love to have a system like this because because <laughs> high balls and yeah, that's true. It's one of my maybe worst points in refereeing. I'm not really good in, in high balls. Yeah, I see some high balls and not, but I believe the most of my mistakes are in high balls. And if you will have a system like a, a, a hawk eye, it would be perfect. But still, we can see it in, in the football right now. Uh, they have video referees or whatever, and still mistakes are happening. There won't be any sport on this world without any mistakes from officials. Yes. You know, uh, some people say, well, that if referees get paid, they would do a better job. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to be paid in the last 33 years. It means maybe I don't have to work anymore, but... Um, <laughs> wow, you refereed so much. <laughs> without any money normally. But I don't care about the money, it's for fun. 
Um, no, if referees get paid, the, I think the meaning is uh, then they can focus on sport and train uh, five times a week of refereeing. And yes, I think then the refereeing in general would be on a higher level. But it's too much money we need for that, for the referees in the world. Yes. So, Alex, you don't get paid. So, why do you do it? It's <laughs> <laughs> the first time that I heard this question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you hear it all the time. Yeah, I, love, I love the sport and I love the people they are involved with goalball. Goal like, Wilma, we met several times. We had fun and it's with many referees, also with, with coaches and players. It's a good spirit in our sport. And when I bring people from outside global to tournaments and they always said, wow, it's so warm, this sport. It's, it's a good human connection. They are always impressed and that's what I really love. It's a very, a very healthy environment, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. Uh, Alex, um, I know that you've been in several protest committees. Uh, what can you recommend to teams uh, who use, which use this way of uh, fight for their victory? Well, um, a protest, you had to sign in for a protest in a very short time after the game. So you're still under emo emotional pressure. And I think that's a bit of a problem because you have to be quick doing a protest. And it's difficult to give any advice because if you feel hey, that something went wrong and I have to do a protest, yeah, just do it. But at the end, it's uh, several times later, uh, there's any outcome of a protest in which way ever. But then you have to say, okay, that's the outcome. Now it's two hours later. Okay, it's the right thing now. Yes or no. Okay. I think that refereeing is about constant learning. How do you improve, learn, try to be a better referee each time? <laughs> yeah, for me, I'm not very happy if I'm doing mistakes by myself. So every time there was a mistake or I missed something or whatever, I said, no, I can't say this word now. <laughs> but, um, I'd like to uh, say, okay, it shouldn't happen anymore to me. I think that's my way to improve myself still. And it, it won't stop till the end of my referee life. Yeah. Do you have some kind of self-talk? Something that you tell to yourself before you enter the court in order to put yourself in the right mood? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, most, most of the time I'm very relaxed. relaxed. So it's, sometimes there's a bit pressure the start yeah. of a tournament a little bit or very, very important games. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, I'm more relaxed pe person. Yes. I also noticed that uh, referees are the first one to be blamed when some new rules are being introduced. So, for example, during the last World Championships in Malmö, there was this new rule, like new eye sheets, not new rule, but new eye sheets. And we got instructions how to deal with those eye sheets. And I remember you, you followed those instructions and you were threatened by one player. Yeah, because you had his eye sheets too tight and he asked for your address. He wanted to send you something home. Were you scared? <laughs> Algeria, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, it's, I think for many players, as well for coaches, they have the feeling that uh, referees or referee committee or whoever, uh, that the officials are putting in the rules and don't take really notice 
what they like to have or what they need to have. Um, and I think it should be more more uh, published the way how rule changes are going on, that people understand it's not the rules the referee make the rules. No, we just have to follow the rules in the same way like the players. Mm -hmm. So, I Alex, if there was a like a clinic for coaches, players, and referees, what would you recommend that each should tell to each other, like? Referees to coaches, referees to players, players to referees, coaches to referees, and so on. In, a, in order to have this common understanding. Well, I think the conversation between coaches and players are quite good. But <laughs> we, we referees, we should, uh, I think we should know, or many referees should know what's important uh, from the view of a coach or from the view of a player. What's important? important to have to get from a referee, his acting, his reactions or whatever. And as well, I think for referees, it, it won't be bad to want to play goalball for yourself, just to feel what is important. And uh, also maybe to be a coach sometimes in a, in a, a sport club or wherever, uh, just to know, hey, as a coach, it's important that a referee looks to me. So uh, then you're on court and say, yeah, I have to look more to the coach because it's important for him. Have you been a player and a coach? Um, yeah, for a long time. But like I said, we only played Tobo in Stuttgart. So I played a couple of years Tobo and I'm still coaching since more than 30 years our Stuttgart club team. Yeah, can you tell us more about Torball? About oh, it? Yeah, because Tor, tor in uh, German is actually out of goal, no? Pardon? Tor in German is goal. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it should be almost like goal ball, no? Tor yeah. ball. In English, it's the same word. No, it, yeah, comes, yeah. From the, it comes from the same roots and during the uh, 60s, is separated a little bit with the ball, so in Toba it's smaller. But to be honest, the high level sport is goalball, of course. Toba is fun, it's, it's fine to play, it's good for elder people and young, they can play together. I think it's hard in goalball if a 25 guy throw the ball to a 81 year old guy, and mm -hmm. I got a age different in my sports club with uh, 64 years. So that's more easy in, in Torball. But the high level sport, it's of course, it's goalball. Um, Alex, uh, we know that uh, you were a member of the referees advisory group for several years. Um, can you tell us what actually this group does? Uh, well, I think the role of the group change uh, sometimes. But that time, when I was a member of the RAC, um, we get some situations, some game situations. They were not really clear in the rules. And then we have to decide what's uh, the best way to interpret the rules and the situation. What should follow uh, if something happened? Which action of the referee should follow? Mm -hmm. And also we did uh, that time the selection for the major tournaments. Okay. The referee selection. Alex, you get, uh, I saw that you get a lot of positive feedback from coaches and players for being a good referee. At the same time, you get criticized sometimes by authority for not being serious enough <laughs> what do you think about it you said that you are normally relaxed going on court so maybe some people think that it's a bad thing that you know you should be very serious how does it help you or not help you to be a good referee yeah well in one way it's normal to get positive and negative feedback and I am like I am, so I'm a, I'm a positive, I'm a um, 
person, I'm a very positive thinking person and I'm not, um, I'll just say, <laughs> um, okay, it's good to have the positive feedback and if someone criticizes me, then I like to know why and what's the reason and if it's true, so maybe I have the chance to change it or I stay like I am. So this is the end of our first part. It was uh, actually about the inside goal ball. Uh, don't go anywhere. We will be right back for the second part for national and global context. And welcome back for the second part about national and global context. Vilma, what can we say about it? Oh, we can talk about Germany. So Germany is a huge country, is the most populated European Union country, right? Exactly. It is. Yes. Yeah. So how tell us about global in Germany? How is it organized in this huge country? <laughs> well, we have a uh, club teams and the German association and um, it was at the beginning global was mainly in the east part of Germany and we had in, in western Germany only a national team and after the reunion uh, they start more and more teams playing global so now we have a German national league with uh, eight teams and a second division with uh, around nine teams. How many players uh, in global? Oh my god! <laughs> I'm I'm not very close to the teams Appro because I'm just approximately. The approximately, <laughs> um, approximately. Don't worry. I remember uh, it was okay. Yeah, yeah. I I can't really tell because there are many blind schools as well playing global. Okay. And so I can't really tell how many players in total play global. Mm -hmm. What I really liked about your system in Germany that you had one person, at least it used to be uh, former players, Stefan Lema, who coordinated everything. Is it still the same? Well, he coordinated a lot. And we have a, a volunteer club organized by players, by national players, uh, Active Goal. And they organize, organize now German championships together with uh, club teams and the organizer. So they are also doing a lot of work. Okay, okay. So, uh, and uh, you live in Stuttgart. And once you were in Vilnius, in my town, you said that Stuttgart and Vilnius look similar. Can you tell us more about your town where you live? In which part of Germany is it? And tell us about Stuttgart. Okay, Stuttgart is in the uh, southwest part of Germany, in the state called Baden-Württemberg. It's the capital of, of Baden-Württemberg. And it's, well, it's very close to France. It's maybe an hour by car. It's also an hour to Switzerland and an hour and 30 to Austria. So it's down in the southwest of Germany. And because <laughs> when I said to you, it looks like Vilnius, it's very hilly. Stuttgart is the, is the city with the biggest vineyards in a huge city in Germany. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, about your experience, you've been refereeing in all con continents, most probably. Uh, yeah. How many countries have you already visited? Oh my god, <laughs> I haven't count. Um, many, uh, maybe 30, 20. Oh, and it this, should be more, I should it have be it. more. But this, the, actually, this, this question has, um, has uh, another, uh, another sequence because uh, you have really conducted not only uh, uh, being referee in, in games and tournaments, uh, but also uh, as a referee clinic. Um, I know that you were, because I, I read it on online, I know that you were in Israel, for example, in 2017. Uh, 
what can you tell us about goalball and people in goalball in those different countries? I mean, for example, in, uh, in, in, in Israel, I think you, you had also Russian teams there in the clinics? Well, a Russian team played when the uh, Israeli uh, referees did their clinic. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the referees only were from Israel at that time. Mm -hmm. And the year before, I, I ran a clinic in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge difference, yeah. Exactly. Uh, th this, is, this, is, this is why the, the, the question is, is so interesting. I mean, uh, the, your answer, it will be interesting. Because uh, you, you have been in so many different countries, uh, not only cultural, but also social and economical uh, different uh, countries from one, one another. Uh, how can you tell the difference in goalball between those countries? I mean, e Egypt from Israel and from uh, the north of Europe, for example, or Latin America? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge difference sometimes. Because in, in Europe, we are very uh, strict and organized and everything should be punctual. It's well, not in Portugal. <laughs> 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 Come on! I didn't say that. <laughs> no, I have, I have to, I have to make the defense of Portugal right now. I mean, we are, we cannot be the most punctual people on earth, but uh, uh, everything goes well in the same time. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. exactly. And for example, the referee clinic in, in uh, Egypt, I ran the goals. They had no form around, and suddenly during the day. Uh, anyone, uh, someone brought in the form for the goal and the referees already started to do the ice shade check. And they said, mm -hmm. okay, we do it now to put on the form on the goal post and the crossbar. And it took us 45 minutes to put all the form on it. And the players were still waiting on court. They relaxed, the coaches were sitting and a lot of stuff. They put all the form around the goals and nobody took care about it. So. It's very relaxed. So I think... The they have all the time in the world, isn't it? Oh, I think the Europeans sometimes can learn about a relaxed life. <laughs> no, but coaches, they worry because like players, they do their warm-up. So that's yeah. why they have to start the game in time. Yeah, but that time nobody was worried about... Uh, because it's very <laughs> warm in Egypt. Well, and maybe they, they don't need a warm-up. Stuff like this. <laughs> it's, it's it's not necessary to always live in a hurry or whatever. And in terms in terms of goalball, Alex, do you can you point out some difference in the in the game played in the court? Uh, does does the technique is different from countries from one another or continents or something like that? I mean, for example, uh, you've been also in Canada, I guess. How is goalball in Canada for? compared to Egypt, for example, or Latin America, as I told you, in Brazil? Well, at the end, everybody played global under the same rules. And to be honest, I'm a referee and I don't really look like, the, I'm not a coach, a global coach. I don't look oh, how they play the technique in this way and say, is it a high ball or not? Is it? I'm looking more on the technical stuff. I, I don't uh, compare the global from one system to the other. Okay. Um, I think I'm the wrong person for this question. Okay, of course, of course. It's your no, point. But, but you know, just maybe the, the so, social life, because when you are doing referees clinics, you are treated like a king, really. I mean, you are the most important person <laughs> during those days. So how are you treated maybe in different countries can you tell us some funny stories or not necessarily funny <laughs> well i try not to be the most important person because i'm i'm part of the whole of everybody so for example the referee clinic in egypt uh the the candidates they were very happy because um, when they, on, during the game, when they watched and looked at me, I just smiled. So it took a lot of pressure from them. And if you're looking very strict or whatever, during the game, 
They say, oh my God, he's watching me. A lot of pressure. No, relax and do your job like I won't be here. Very good. So this is actually the end of our second part. Uh, we'll be right back for the third and the last part about Alexander himself. And welcome to the third and the last part, uh, which is will be about um, Alexander himself. Uh, tell us a little bit about more of you. So, what can we say about it, Vilma? Oh yes, Alex, you have been a gardener, yeah. I think that's why you always look so healthy and energetic, and you have a perfect vision, which is very important for global referee. What do you love about this profession, being a gardener? Well, to working outside, not in an office, in the sun, in the rain, to have feel the soil in the hands, to do my, look my, my roses over there. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering <laughs> what flowers it. are there. Yeah. No, I really love it to be, and at the end of a day, you actually see what you did the whole day, and that's perfect. Where, where, where does it come this passion about flowers? I don't know. It's in myself. <laughs> I love it because as a child we we didn't have a garden at home, so I don't know where it comes from. It was there, and when I choose to be a gardener, um, after a couple of days, I said, "Yeah." That's absolutely the right job for me. So for so how many years have you been doing this job? Well, I started with my education in uh, 85. So now it's in total 35 years. And I was so you, 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 you came from, uh, from Bot Botanic, yep. I came from Botanic? Uh, yes, um, I think it's bo uh, botanic. Uh, I, now I now I was lost in in the word. Uh, okay. You mean that he studied botanics, or what do you mean he came? Yeah, botan. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Did you um, study biology or botanics, or what? I, I didn't study. It's a three-year education. Oh, okay, okay. Wow. So. Um, which flowers would you recommend for uh, visually impaired people to enjoy? Like something they can be good in touch or some nice smell or something? Well, of course, uh, the smell is very important. And there are beautiful flowers with a beautiful smell, but also plants with a very, very interesting smell. And that's that's perfect. Well, yeah, the blind people knows better, but there are... Uh, blind gardens for people to feel plants and to smell many different smells. There are uh, there are blind gardens for for yeah. blind people. Yeah. Where some, are they? Yeah. Um, and in some uh, botan botanical universities, we have we have them. But uh, to be honest, I don't know the city right now where it is. But I heard sometimes from some of them. Actually, it is it is funny because if you travel so much from different cities, do you also uh, look for uh, botanic places to to visit? Yeah, and I well between the games when I'm off duty, I love to walk outside the venue to look where is a botanical garden or just in, in Lisbon. I just walk around uh, to see something. Yeah, good. Yeah, we have uh, we have actually a, a botanic garden in the in one of the parks over here in Lisbon, but I was I was living in Hamburg for two years and they also have a very nice plantum bloomen there. Oh yeah, in Hamburg. But I was yeah. there. I, ju I just heard because that's on the other side of Germany. I just yeah, it's in the north. It, yeah, and I never been there. You never been in Hamburg? Oh, in Hamburg, but not in the plantum bloomen. Oh, okay, okay. But you have to go there because it's very beautiful. Yeah. It's very nice. But you know, most of the time as a referee, we saw the hotel 
the venue and maybe the airport or the train station. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and few other, other things, exactly. Uh, yes. Alex, you collect Euro coins. Do you still collect Euro coins? Yeah, of course, yeah. Because yes, it, how many have you got? <laughs> well, I didn't count them. And From how many countries? I'm, well, countries, I think all of the European countries, except the very special ones, like uh, Vatican State or Andorra or San Marino. Yep. But the normal ones, I got all of them, yeah. Okay, what are you going to do with it? Well, it's to know from which country they are. And always when I'm on shopping and I get back money and I saw coins from, oh, cool, from Ireland or, wow, from Lithuania or Slovenia. That's cool. <laughs> okay, do you collect anything else? Rocks. Rocks? <laughs> yeah. Okay. In my, in my you... garden outside here. No, when I'm uh, on tournaments all over the world, I have to take at least one rock with me. So in, in my garden, I've got rocks from all over the world. Do you remember where are, they are from? Yeah, most of the rocks. <laughs> oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. And uh, Alex, I found one old email. It says, our daughter Linda oh was born on 21st of January 2009 at 3 o'clock 28 minutes, 2 kilograms, 645 grams, 46 centimeters tall. How is Linda now? It looks like I'm collecting rocks and you're collecting emails. <laughs> 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 no, Linda is fine. She's now 11 and uh, going to school, growing up and have fun with her girlfriends. Okay. Really good. Is she a gold, uh, gold judge, maybe, in gold box? No. Um, I believe Linda, she's, she played handball. She's playing handball and there are not many chances to go to go ball, uh, to Toba because we have no Goba. And for sh for her, it's a bit boring to be uh, in the venue and just watching and not acting by herself. Adrian, my, my second son, uh, he was already with me at the uh, German Championships when I was refereeing and he was a gold judge. <laughs> and, uh, How did he so, like it? No, oh, he liked it so much because the the German national coach, he came to him and, and he said, hey, you're the best school boy in this venue, uh, the gold church in this venue. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He also I, liked to play Toba, but he really is interested in the blind sport. Okay, um, what, what about your third child? The Daniel? Old, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, my oldest son, it's Daniel. He's yeah. now already 27 and He's uh, still on university and he's helping when we have some tournaments in Stuttgart. He's helping, but he's not really um, uh, doing a lot of stuff in blind spot. Um, how, how, how does your uh, three children uh, perceive uh, your activity as a referee? Are they, are they happy to have a referee daddy or that travels a lot? Or do they feel that goal ball takes their daddy? I mean, not for the 27th, not for Daniel anymore, mm -hmm. but Linda has uh, 11. So um, the, do they feel happy to have a, a, a daddy, uh, which is a referee, or they, they feel a little bit your, your absences? I, I think it's both. Um, well, they're happy when they get postcards from all over the world. And <laughs> I think they were proud because I was a twice a referee at a German TV show on a Saturday night show and they saw me live on TV and they were proud of this. But cool. I think most of the time uh, they miss me because I'm not here for them, playing with them or whatever. So especially when they were younger, uh, it's a lot of time they... Uh, haven't daddy with them because of the sport they have 
they have nothing to do with goalball, no? None of them. None of them. Uh, uh, you said that uh, Linda is a handball player and the other two, Adrian uh, and, and uh, Daniel, they, were they playing anything? Yeah, were Adrian is also a really good handball player. He's yeah. 14. Mm -hmm. And uh, Daniel just do some sport for himself, fitness studio or whatever, but no yeah. team sport. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that TV program on German television. What was it about Global? It was a, it was just a game show, and one little part uh, was uh, they had to do 15 games against each other, and one little game was goalball. Well, it was the name of goalball and the same ball, but all the other stuff it was one against one and different goals, a different court. But it was it was a nice experience. But it was fun to see how TV works. Okay, so you refereed and you were explaining goalball or you were... No, I, I just refereed because they just need a winner and the winner get the points and then they did the next game. Okay, so how many minutes did it take? Uh, it was 10 throws and the one who scored more was the winner. Okay, it's interesting. Is it normal to show like... Paralympic sport on German TV? Well, they had uh, a pool of many, many uh, sports ideas. And that's not only Paralympic sports, it's yeah, okay. many sports and you never heard about it. And it yeah. was, was it, was it on national TV or it was a regional one? No, it was national TV. Okay. And it was funny because it was a Saturday night show live. Ooh. And Monday morning, when I came back to work, Uh, the first person, hey, referee, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> you are a national star. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think around 7 million people watch this show. Oh, wow. Actually, uh, that was one of the questions that uh, we were, uh, have to make. Um, is there any goalball in, uh, in, the t in uh, German TV? I mean, broadcasted, games uh, broadcasted in, in German TV? Well, not live. When, when the German national team, uh, when they won last year the European Championships, then it was on, on the news on television. But, okay. But the game, the game was not, uh, was not broadcasted, no? No. Not, okay. not, not on, uh, on the regular television. Okay. Mm -hmm. By internet, we had some channels when you can also uh, watch global, but not on the television. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alex. You were actually, you made a big influence on me because you encouraged me to, to take IPSA exams and become international referee. Yeah, I know, what? 2004. Yeah, oh, you have a good memory. <laughs> so what, how would you encourage young people or, for example, Pedro is going to take <laughs> exams and become global referee how would you exactly. encourage young people what would you tell to them those who are interested in being referees oh i just tell them okay if you start to being a referee there's a chance that we both can be on court together <laughs> wow <laughs> this is the, the biggest award <laughs> <laughs> that would be that would be awesome yeah and what would you tell them when you meet in the center of the court and the beginner is nervous i i, I just uh push a bit forward be relaxed and it's everything's okay and enjoy that's the important thing enjoy the game on I, have, I haven't made the clinic yet, but I'm already relaxed for the game. <laughs> hey, I'm looking forward to do a game with you together, Petro. Oh, thank you, Alex. Me too, me too. And Alex, which teachers do you remember? Who made the biggest influence on you? The biggest influence on me? Well, I think... Um, Clive Spencer mm. and as well Dina, Dina Murdy. Mm -hmm. And I think those two are maybe the biggest. And of course, at the beginning, 
Britta and Mariana from Denmark because that was on my very first clinic. Yes. Yeah. But in which way? What did you learn from them? Like about goalball, about perception of, of the sport? What do you remember? <laughs> well, from Britta and Marianne, uh, how to, uh, because goalball was new for me and to be two referees on court was new for me that time. And I learned from them the movement, the communication. And from Clive, it was a lot of general stuff and the, the uh, gentleman behavior. And I really enjoyed that. It was, it was amazing. And also Dina is the, the fine English way. And I really liked it, yeah. I think that they influenced me by this. And I think but most of the rest, uh, it's just by training, doing a lot of games, then you get more and more. Yes. So Alex, uh, when you when you finish your career as a global referee, how do you want to be remembered? <laughs> uh, I think in a way uh, like it's now that everybody, some people don't like me, they should remember like they want. Most of the people think I'm, I'm sometimes a funny guy, my sense of humor, yeah, just keep that in my mind. Because, and sometimes it changes. There's one, one, one little story in the, uh, the referee clinic in Egypt. Uh, one evening, we were the officials together on a boat on the River Nile. And then uh, Dr. Ahmad Owen, he is the uh, chairman of Egypt uh, Blind Sport. And he asked me, Alexander, why are you so happy and funny at a clinic, but wh why you are you so strict on court? And I said, oh, why? And then we talked about it, and he used to be a Gogo player in the past, a national player. And then we talked about a situation in uh, Barcelona, the Paralympics, and there was a player who was cheating badly from Egypt, always moving his eye shades. And I had a game and I tried to say something to him and he can't speak English. So I went to the bench and asked, is there anyone talking English? And it was one player said, yes. And so I grabbed him, he was a B1. I went on court and I said, okay, if he's doing it one more time, I have to kick him out and you have to play with two players. Then the both Egyptians shout against each other. And then I went back and then I asked uh, on the boat on the River Nile. So is it possible that you were my interpreter in Barcelona? And he said, yes, it was me. <laughs> and then I said, but that time you were wearing a beard. And then he smiles on his secretary and he said, he remembers me. And then we <laughs> hugged each other and we were laughing and laughing and laughing. So sometimes people remember me in a different way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alex, I see that you are, you are a great storyteller. Imagine you would write a book about gold ball. Tell us one more story or two more short stories that should be included in that book. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the one in Egypt is a very special one. And a very great moment was at a, uh, in, in uh, see, 2000, the opening ceremony, and we had to go an hour before the start of the opening ceremony into the stadium with a lunch bag, and then we waited to start and it's boring. And then I said, hey, come on guys, let's do the wave. And the people watch me, hey, wow. So five, four, three, two, and we did it. And maybe 10 people did it with me. And another one, and then 20, 50. And after seven times, the wave starts rolling around the stadium. 
two times and oh my god it was me so cool that was really really cool <laughs> <laughs> awesome really awesome and that was in 2002 2000 2000 sydney. in sydney yeah yeah amazing thank you so much alex uh you are You're welcome you are really an awesome uh, storyteller. And uh, this is uh, actually the end of our first episode. Uh, it was with Alexander Necht uh, from Stuttgart in Germany. He is a widely known referee for everybody in the goalball family knows him. So we will thank you, of course, uh, to you, Alex. Thank you, Vilma. And uh, we'll be in the next episode. Uh, stay tuned with us. Thank, Thank you for the invitation. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>